before this this practice of uh, observing the sense you know, observing the sense I, I am is that do you reckon is that, is that quite compatible with this practice or is it sort of going in a slightly different direction well it's an upaya you know so you because what I wanted to do is really like I am is a statement of presence really it's, it's not even personal yet mm-hmm. you know just on the practical level of the grammar I am it's a statement of presence of being here and then it, I am I am then it starts going into the personal so you, you begin to discern the difference between the function of the pronoun I as it becomes strongly identified with adjectives from other things. And so, you know, like in Hinduism, they use I am a lot as a kind of mantra. But in terms of investigation of, of the fetters, you know, I just I wanted to see what it's like to have this sense of I am, and and uh, so I just kept thinking it over and over and trying to how this how thinking I am uh, how the effect of that, and it is a sense of presence of being present, which is fair enough. It's not it's not like something wrong with it, but it is, and then it then it goes into I am better than you are, or I'm an American, you're Norwegian. Then it goes into, you know, differentiating, uh, approving, disapproving. I am is not nothing but a statement, and that's not about being better, worse, or whatever than than anyone else. Or I then I am an American. Is 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 a you know it's like. Um, Satya is conventional fair enough I have a passport and so forth so that on the conventional level it's, it's fair enough but then the identity with that word you know what like I am an American because if you keep observing it has a certain kind of emotional you feel something about it because you, you're condi- like I'm conditioned through that culture, my generation, very different from yours, I think, and uh, it was, <laughs> you know, it was, I was born in the 30s, so I mean, you know, you're in a depression and a war and so forth, and the whole sense of being American was very patriotic, very powerful, but it was conditioned into, into culture and being able to observe that then I began to to discern that that which is aware of I am is not an I am but it is what it is I am is merely a linguistic convention and uh, you know so in other languages it's something else but in in um, so, so it's not like ultimately we are just a, a linguistic mechanism but the sense of I you know the, the sense of I tends to isolate me as if, as if the reality of my life is this body and uh, and my life and my you know it's very it puts you always in as, as uh, some kind of contrast to the external you know it, it, it holds you within in the egoistic form, uh, and and then you're, you know, you're educated and conditioned to to function within that form, within that structure. So, so it is very limiting to have an ego. Is you know, and if like it can be, you know, even if I think I'm better than somebody, that's suffering. Or I'm not as good as everyone is suffering. Or I'm the same as, you know, in the scriptures they talk about. It. You know, I'm just, that we're all the same. I'm just, we're all just as good as, or superior or inferior. So that it's not about inferior or superior or the same, but about 
language, thought, concept, conceiving the words, and then the critical attitudes that come from that. Because inevitably, you know, say, this is better, this is, you know, this is a glass, and this is a bottle, and so forth, and this is plastic, and this is glass, and then we, then we have a music that's plastic, you know, in England they think plastic is, they say plastic always is a sneer, glass is all right, I mean, these are, <laughs> and, you, and you get to see your own, you know, your own biases, and, and cultural assumptions. It's not to say that, that it's wrong to sneer at plastic, but to realize it is like this. And then, uh, and then comparing yourself, like the ego is very, you know, like in, in Americans, they you're brought up in an egalitarian ideal that we're all equal, but it's the most competitive society you'll ever live in. You probably realized when you were there, all of that competition, proving you're better than somebody else. So it's confusing, you know, you've got the ideal of everybody, we're all equal, and then, and then compete with each other for, you know, the winners, that's, that's, that's what we just held out, to be a winner, not a loser. Well, I mean, and these are cultural attitudes that, you know, that we don't even choose, we acquire them through that osmosis to being born in that society where everybody thinks like that. And so then the then the feeling of I'm not as good. If I'm not winning, if I'm not the best, then I'm not very good. Because <laughs> you you know, you tend to compare yourself with the best. And so then you you know, you're never going to you might have moments where you can be the best, but you can't, it's unsustainable, you can't sustain the best. So, but language has its purpose, you know, so we have, you know, we have to just discriminate, this is bigger and smaller, and this is blue, and this is red, and there's nothing, you know, not denying the practical validity of language and, and critical mind, but when we're attached to that function, then we, we're blinded by it. We become, we're always comparing things with how, with ideals and with, with what we think is the best and the worst and the fears that come, you know, emotional fears of failure. Like with men, a tremendous fear of being a failure. Because the, the ideal is to be a winner. And to be accepted, to be liked in the society, not to be persecuted or rejected by society. We all fear rejection. We want to be accepted and loved and admired in society. We don't want to be despised and abused. So the ego develops around this. The experiences we have and the identity, you know, what class identity. Um, the working class or middle class, whatever these are very fraught identities in, in the England class structure. Mm -hmm. They do affect how you interpret your self worth. Is like a working class is it inferior to middle class or Upper class. Being upper class is probably better than being working class. I mean, the kind of, you know, this kind of snobbery, this kind of uh, attitude of something better than something else, which is not, you know, which is in many cases is the way it is. True, but but this is the way out of that, out of those two extremes, out of better, the best and worst, and good and bad, and that's through through this uh, awareness. It's always amazed me how simple it is, considering how complicated, you know, look at your own body. 
how complicated it is, all the things affecting consciousness at this moment, you know, that, that you know, that only when it starts going wrong that we bring attention to it. You know, so then it, it and then just physically or sensually, you know, just the eye, what an amazing organ that is. And I have to have this degenerative eye problem, so so I go to this uh, eye hospital in Bangkok, and they have all the high tech. You know, they do all these kind of photographs of my retina, and I've seen all this, you know, pictures of my retina and, and the things that the kind of blood vessels that go funny, and, the, and then they. Uh, and you see, you know, really the eye is quite an impressive, amazing organ, quite delicate. And and what we see, you know, we just take for granted. But it does affect us, you know, whether it's light or dark, or or you know, just the shades and and colors and shapes affect that has a, has an effect on our make us happy or sad or greedy or averse or angry or bored or whatever. So you you know, you're kind of living in a totally sensitive situation on this planet. The whole planet is sensitive. You know, so you it seems like a trap. How do you, how can you get outside the power of this planet, the weather and the and the physical body? Is there any way out of it, or are we just helplessly caught, trapped in these forms and on this planet in this sense realm? And then the the wonder is that there is a way out. It's mindfulness, <laughs> and, uh, and and at first, you know, I thought this is impossible. You know, I kind of start thinking about it. A moment of mindfulness easily gone because you're thrown right back into your old obsessions and fears but as you keep practicing more and more and cultivating it then it becomes the stronger point mindfulness becomes stronger than your emotions or your or the worldly impingements or the problem physical emotional problems that you experience it, it's a stronger force but at first it seems I mean I do when I first saw, had this insight into this I I, I remember throwing myself on the floor and started crying. I can't do it. It's impossible. It just seemed totally impossible. But emotionally, I just couldn't handle it. And uh, and yet there was something outside me observing this this person lying on the floor crying. I can't do it. It's a, it is a strange kind of, as I remember it, you know, there's actually this form crying, I can't do it, and then there is something outside that observing it. And I began to say that, that observing, you know, that's what led me on, is that, is trusting in that. Because on a personal level, sometimes it seems hopeless, impossible, and on anyway. any way. You know, so you... You, you can't believe that. You know, I don't, don't believe any of those kind of thoughts or feelings that that, that I can have. I know what they are. And then, you know, like, I found, you know, like, because my tendency was to try to attack the ego. I don't want an ego. Uh, there's some, I have certain egotistical tendencies that I don't like about myself at all. And there's not uh, ten, uh, emotional habits and assumptions on a personal level that I, the, the critical side of me doesn't like about me as a person. So, so uh, you know, I thought, I can't just you know, get rid of my ego because that comes from this desire to get rid of something. But 
But sakya dizzy then became more of a useful term as a fetter because it, I had to put it into a practical use. What do I mean by that? Not just poly dictionary, but in a practical situation. And so I deliberately started creating my, using my ego and listening to it in both its positive and negative form. So it was kind of fun in a way, because then you, you kind of had the, the right to be a bastard and say things, think things that were very good, but you were observing. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, so you're not trying to convince yourself you shouldn't be bad or angry or selfish, or, but you can be really selfish and listen to it. So I, I take maybe selfishness to a really absurd degree, you know. And, and sometimes it can break out laughing, it's so silly, you know, selfishness. Okay. Rather than just thinking I shouldn't be selfish, I, I really observe, you know, taking selfishness, not acting on it, you know, not because you're, you know, but listening to it like you're watching a television show or something, and listening to the radio, and you, and and then you're, and then the tendency to criticize, oh, selfishness is bad, I shouldn't, I don't do that. Just be selfish and listen and observe the feeling of being totally obsessed with yourself as a person, what you look like, and, and vanity and whatnot. So, so then, you know, through that, I could actually, I, I got this insight, you know, suck it, it is that, I have to think, I have to create, I have to use language, I have to use pronouns and adjectives, and, and that, to become somebody. And then that which is aware of the ego is not the ego. So then, then the, then I have this insight of, I, I rest in this awareness of the ego, not in the ego. Because the ego, you see, you know, it can change and, be very nice, very stupid, or whatever, but this awareness is not about being nice or, or being stupid, but it, it's, uh, it's certainly here and now, it's bright, you're not dull and, you know, you're not in a, in a fog. It has a, a, a brightness and a, and a discerning ability. 